Hi, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah here with the Midwest Writing Center and I'm super, super excited to welcome um, comic artist and master of visual and critical studies, Elk Powell. Um, Elk, thank you so, so much for being here. I am out of my mind excited um, as someone who's been familiar with you and your work for a little while. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to meet you. And um, when I was reaching out and looking for someone who could do some, some educational work on the comic, you were recommended a lot. <laughs> um, and so it was super scary for me actually to reach out to you. And I cannot believe my, my good fortune that, that you're here with me today. So thank you so much. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit about how you got into comics, please. Sure. Um, thank you guys for having me at the Midwest Writing Center. I'm very honored to be here. Um, yeah, how did I get into comics? I guess just the classic nerd story. I grew up watching a bunch of cartoons, um, which included since I was a 90s kid, like Sailor Moon, Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, that kind of stuff. So it was a very natural progression for me to be like, oh, I want more of this content. I'm going to start reading the comic versions. Um, I also, my mom got me into newspaper funnies. She calls them the funnies, the comics in the newspaper. So I was like a really, really huge Garfield fan, which is hilarious. Ex post facto is now like Garfield is a meme, but I love Garfield. Um, I also recommend Garfield minus Garfield, which is a web comic online where they just have John Arbuckle talking to himself with no Garfield. Very <laughs> I good. haven't seen that. It's really good. Um, but yeah, no, yeah, I started when I was a kid, I would get um, an allowance every week and I would go to um, Awajimaya, which is this Japanese grocery store downtown Seattle. And there's a bookstore in the back called Kinokuniya. And I would spend, you know, however much money I had every week on like one volume of comics, you know, at a time until I built up this like really pretty, well, masterfully nerdy collection of manga by the time I was like 12, so. Yeah, and then I went to the Seattle Public Library and just started devouring literally anything else that I saw because um, they just had such a wide variety. And I was like, I want to read anything I can. So that was pretty much how I got started, especially with like indie comics and international comics and stuff too. So I um, I love that. I love, well, I especially love the 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 sweet little manga beginnings. But um, I totally forgot about that bookstore at Awajimaya, uh, for those who don't know. Um, I lived in Seattle for nine years. I always either say eight or 10, and I think the reality is nine. Um, and um, I lived in Pioneer Square. So a lot of the times so I watched Maya was my grocery store. And I always, I not always, I recently forgot about that bookstore, but I would buy pens like it was going out of style from, or just coming into style maybe from, <laughs> from that store. I, oh, yeah. I felt a little lost in there because I don't read comics so much um but god what a beautiful environment and that it has like that upstairs yeah actually I just remembered there's a kid on here oh, not in Chicago proper but just in the suburbs it's at um the Mitsuma market they have a kid on bookstore in there too and I go there often as well which is great because cool. every time I go there it's like my happy place you know because it's like where I basically grew up <laughs> oh, I love that I had no idea I mean I was way less cool when I lived in Chicago um, for one year than, <laughs> you know, growing up and uh, growing into an adult in Seattle. I, I expanded my horizons a whole lot. Um, so I'm looking at your bio that I didn't read. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm going to read it a little bit, I guess. Um, your nonfiction and autobiographical comics cover topics such as relationships, trans identity, philosophy, and your favorite outdoor activity, sailing. That's where I first learned about you was from sailing. Um, you're from Seattle, but you're currently in Chicago at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And your thesis, this is what I was really excited about getting to, was a web comic on the philosophy of time. Um, how does one write a comic thesis? And how does one write anything about the concept of time, please um, tell me, you know, as um, in layman terms, how that worked. Yeah, actually, yeah. So the, the nuts and bolts actual most difficult part was finding a program that actually would let me make a comics thesis. So I went to the Art Institute, which is 
probably one of the best decisions personally I've ever made. The school is just amazing. The staff, especially in the visual and critical studies department is just very supportive of doing whatever you want artistically. Um, so like there are a couple other kids in my program where their theses were like in textiles or, you know, like there was another student that produced a work that involved this like building this whole room that had exuded different smells in different areas. Like it's a very, very interdisciplinary, like out there program, which is why I love it. Um, but yeah, so I had a couple of advisors that just were really supportive and like gung-ho about my work. And actually, initially, I was just going to make a website on the philosophy of time. And then they were like, but you make comics, like make it a comic website. Like, why don't you just do that? And so I ended up working with my collaborator and boyfriend, Andrew Olmsted, who helped me literally build a website from scratch, which was very difficult, but very rewarding. Um, but yeah, the research part was like already in my head. Like I've been reading up on the philosophy of time for ugh, years now. I took a couple of, I took one class at the University of Washington called Narrative as Time Travel, which is an incredible course um, with Mark Patterson, Professor Mark Patterson. Um, and that just basically blew my mind. And so I made a comic for that class, which was on the JFK assassination called Unspeakable, which you can buy online, even though it's ancient. So my art is like completely different now. But anyway, so I made that small comic and I started thinking about the philosophy of time. And so in the interim, I just read a bunch of books like from hard philosophy to like more fun stuff. And I found this book called, um, what was it? The Fourth Dimension uh, by Rudy Rucker, who's like a cartoonist and mathematician. And I read the book where he has like drawings of how to conceptualize time. And I was like, oh my God, it like totally blew my mind. What's that book? So I was like, I want to make something like this. Like that book was so inspiring that I was like, I want to make a comic about the philosophy of time and how to visualize time, which is the fourth dimension. So I made this website called 4D Time dot space that's the url um which hopefully tries to hammer in the notion that the fourth dimension time um acts like any other physical dimension but we just can't see it so the comic itself is about how to visualize the fourth dimension and how comics in particular can help you um like metaphorically understand the fourth dimension as a physical dimension this is blowing my mind. So, <laughs> so many questions that are not. I know, it's kind of a lot. I mean, like the only thing I could do really is just to be like, go to my website. But I yeah, it's a lot. In the chat, in the, <laughs> in <Cool>. the comments <laughs> or whatever. Um, wow, my mind is reeling. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm totally off topic now in my brain. Um, <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. An English class, I studied English um, on modernism. But like the 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 professor who has now written, I'm gonna look it up. He's now written a textbook on time travel in narrative. I want to say. Oh, I'm like, who? Oh wait, did you go to? Did you go to school in Seattle? Seattle U. I think I think our mutual friend Quinn told me about this professor. Yeah, Charles Tung, Modernism and the Time yeah. Machine. Yeah, I actually bought the textbook because I loved the class oh, so much. <laughs> Yeah, that guy sounded amazing. And Quinn was like, oh, yeah, you should reach out to him. And then I just totally forgot. And I'm like, oh, this is a good reminder. I should reach out to that guy. Um, yeah, and Quinn worked in the English department. Uh, so I don't know that he, I don't, I know that he didn't take the classes, but probably had some really great insights as to who Tong was as a person, is mm -hmm. as a person. Um, yeah, shout out to both the UW English department and Seattle U English department for having amazing time travel classes so now I'm like what is this so cool. uh, <laughs> very, also, very cool. like, totally created a, a modernism obsession in me to the point where I just kind of don't respect any other period of art oh my God. I'm like yes but do you know that you could be modernism <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> oh, so good uh Right, comics, comics, comics. Right, I was like, we just went off on a whole tangent. That was fun. <laughs> so I time travel. I'm, I'm so like, I'm, I'm gonna buy these books. Like, it's gonna be a thing. <laughs> a whole new topic I didn't know I would ever care about, and it's how to visualize time. <laughs> um. So what's um, I understand looking for more of stories right this is how you said you got into it was you know you watched 
anime, which turned into manga. You didn't say those words, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say those words. Um, and also the funnies, which I think is most of us, most of our first experience with comics is is the funny pages. You know, um, at least Peanuts, definitely Kelvin and Hobbes. Yeah. Um, Kelvin and Hobbes, which has more narrative arc, I think, than Peanuts traditionally. Um, I don't know if there's a narrative arc to Garfield, but I think <laughs> Garfield a lot. I was gonna say, I think, I can think of like two narrative arcs offhand, but they last so long and are so inconsequential that it doesn't really matter. I am. Um, mostly about who John Arbuckle was dating, which like, who cares? <laughs> I'm not here for the human. No, no. I'm uh, here for the cat that likes lasagna. <laughs> I have a super, super fat orange cat and I live on Garfield Street. Wow. Street? Road? I don't I don't go anywhere. I don't need to use my address. Um, <laughs> So I think about Garfield a lot, but not enough to like investigate the comic, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after, you know, coming into the realization that you're a storyteller, which I assume that you did or you wouldn't be a storyteller, um, how, how did you decide to, to create comics? Were you always a bit of a, a visual artist or um, is it like the combination of the medium doing, the, doing some heavy lifting? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, this is, an interesting question because I feel like a lot of the time people think of comics as like image and text, like they're two totally separate things. Whereas like, even from when I was like, I, I started drawing basically as soon as I could. Um, and yeah, I, I had made, I actually, one of my, one of my first comics, which will never see the light of day was basically a self-insert fanfic where I was in the world of Pokemon and so yeah, I've just been like, I've been thinking and drawing in comics as like a medium for so long that I don't, like, I tried my hand at like writing, writing. I mean, I don't say writing, writing, because that makes it sound like <laughs> writing, but that, that is antithetical to my point. <laughs> yes. Um, I tried, I tried screenwriting, <laughs> which was a fun disaster. No script. I understand that a lot yeah. of people do script writing. Yeah, which, yeah, I guess now makes sense. You know, I tried like poetry and like, I do have one written word zine that I like, but it's mostly just like cryptic aphorisms. I really love aphorisms. That's the only thing that I consistently write um, because I'm a philosophy nerd. Um, but yeah, now I don't even remember where I was going with this, but yeah, no, I've been, the comics, just like how that, how the structure works just works with my brain so well that I can't, really I don't I'm not really interested in expressing myself in other ways anymore because it's so like it just is right which probably sounds a little odd but no no I mean as someone who has a form that is natural to me uh I totally get that I as a child I had this huge debate as if you know you can only do one thing You're right <laughs> changed position in my chair and regret it and I'm not gonna move while I'm on camera uh, <laughs> but that's why I'm moving weird uh I totally, totally get that. I had this debate with myself as a child, like, am I going to be an actor or am I going to be a writer? First of all, like, you don't need to choose. But second of all, um, I'm not a good actor. <laughs> um, and it, I definitely at least hit a certain point in my life where I realized, like, one of these things is natural and the other one is because I like attention. <laughs> um, that's not <laughs> totally true, but it's it's a little bit true. Um so I feel you like there's there's a form that speaks to you because it's it's the one that's that you're meant to speak through. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it's really important to say, too, because one of my or maybe our as an organization um, favorite conceits, I don't know, um, favorite thing to push on people is that we're all storytellers. Um, and I think that part of that is that there's there's a, a medium that works best for you as a storyteller. For a lot of people, it's it's oral, right? Um, for a lot of people, it's writing. I think the reason that writing shines for so many people, especially um, young and old, right? Not like midlife, but young and old is because it's language. It's very, it's the way we go through life having to communicate with others. So I think that's why written and um, written storytelling appeals to so many people because now I have my story documented, right? Um, I just think it's really, really cool to explore like what format works best for 
for you comes naturally to you. Um, and so yeah, I was thinking, oh, oh, I was thinking of a segue because I know that is something that interviews work well with. Um, yeah, I grew up also playing music. So I played, um, I played the piano and the trombone for years and years, like through college, basically. And then I had this, this crisis where I was like, I can only do one thing. And so I quit playing music, which was really sad. And even now I like, I, I just have this yearning to play music and I just, it just never happens, which is super sad. But one of the, one of the reasons why I think it was so easy for me to fall into spooky action, which is this weird live drawing band thing that I'm in, um, was because I love music and I wanted to create music, but I had horrible stage fright, anxiety about performing music, um, which stemmed from, you know, childhood bad experiences performing, obviously. Um, but through adulthood, I was just terrified of performing and being in front of people. And then I, I collaborated with Andrew Olmsted, the guy who helped me make my website. And we met at the Racer Sessions, which is like a free jazz improvisational group that meets at Cafe Racer in Seattle. Um, RIP Cafe Racer, they're closed now, but we'll see. The Racer Sessions will live on. They're, they're doing things online now via Zoom. They do like a weekly session. So I would go to that mostly because, you know, I like music. And so I would go and listen, just draw as an audience member while people were performing. And then eventually one of the, I think, no, I think it was Andrew. He was basically like, or no, 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 it was another guy, Dio. Dio was a friend of mine who basically came up to me and talked to me just seeing that I was just sitting there and he's like, hey, you know, you come here every week. Do you want to present sometime? And I was like, what? I don't play music. What would I, what would I present? And he was like, well, you could do like drawing, you know, you're always drawing. And like, I've given people who are performers drawings of them while they're performing because that's just I'm a doodler that's what I do and he was like well, why don't you do like some kind of live drawing and I was like that's a great idea and so I borrowed my I borrowed a projector from my dad like a super old one from like the 90s that was just very loud and like grainy and like had like you know the shadows on the edges because it was just super old so I, I brought this projector um with <laughs> with like a connected to a digital camcorder just overhead of my drawing pad, right? And so what we did was we would have performers come up to do an improv, an improv improvisational piece. And then I would do live drawing and where we'd like draw and play music, like riffing off of each other and what we were doing. And it was really mind blowing. It was very difficult, but really fun. And I did one collab um, with Andrew, he came up and I think he he mentioned he remembered it was we did a piece called Cloudscapes because we had like little prompts that we would go off of. And so we did this piece together. And it was just so fun. And we just really clicked, you know, and so we decided he basically asked me, it was like, hey, do you want to do this like more often? Like, could we do this again? And I was like, sure. And then we just ended up making spooky action. And we've done Oh God, tons of gigs. We actually opened for Sunrise Orchestra um, a couple years ago at, and we've just performed at, we performed at the Ballard Jazz Festival. And yeah, it was just kind of crazy. We just started this weird thing and it just took off and people really liked it and were supportive. And I've released a couple of zines also that were, um, that we released at concerts. So we'd have music that would go with the zine. And yeah, it was just super fun. Obviously we're on a hiatus because of like COVID stuff, but we haven't even played any gigs in Chicago since, you know, I was in grad school, but we're planning on getting back together <laughs> and doing more collabs soon. But yeah, anyways, this is just your, your local weird artist person saying that you don't have to just do one thing. Like you can do everything all at once and it'll be fun and cool and weird and people will still like it. So <laughs> this is my favorite story um wow that's so dope and also there's something really really special there too about artists embracing another person's art just because it's there mm -hmm. um that's so special there's so much gatekeeping in the art world um I talk about this a lot because you know I lived in a um a very hierarchical academic town um in which you know you had to be a proper artist or you weren't an artist and there's just a lot of I, I don't think that's universal but I think that we see it a lot as folks who love art um that there is gatekeeping and like this is my place and my art and 
you're the audience. Um, so it's so special and so important that artists love and support and get excited about each other's art, um, especially or maybe not especially when it's a different form of art that can work in conjunction. I, um, I, I have a lot of a lot of things to say about this, um, just mostly in praise. <laughs> oh, I love that so much. Um, we hope I think it's important too. like, I mean, I, I love all kinds of different types of art and I don't think, I don't think it's really talked about enough. Cause like, I barely even, it took me so many years to self-identify as an artist because of that sort of gatekeeping. Right. I was like, no, I'm not an artist. Cause like I do this and I do that and I'm over here and I'm over there. Like I barely even just started self-identifying as an academic and I just got my master's degree, you know, like, it's just weird how you feel like you're not supposed to identify with these certain spaces because of these unspoken rules or whatever. But, um, but on another point, I think it's also really important to, especially if you're in like a specific medium to enjoy work from other mediums. Like I love live theater. I love reading plays. That's like one of my favorite things. Um, I also love opera, which is pretty random, but makes sense since I love music and I love theater. It's like, I love opera. Um, and just like reading, reading poetry, you know, like you can have it all, you know, and it's important to get inspiration from different mediums just so you don't like lock yourself in your own little corner, um, which is why like I love interdisciplinary art and inter interdisciplinary um, academia as well, just because it's important to listen to other people and get inspired by people outside of your own little bubble, you know? We talk about that a lot. My, um, the director of the Midwest Writing Center and I talk a lot about how, you know, the most important thing you can do for your writing is read, but I think that's actually like pretty closed-minded, right? Um, the most important thing you can do for your art mm -hmm. is engage with art. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, that's, that's, advice I give for writer's block too and for um like de depression motivated uh lack of productivity there's a nicer way to say that um but when you're not being productive because of your mental health um I always say like find the lowest barrier art to engage with which um, and the only caveat I give there is like not the sitcom that you binge watch when you're sad, right? Um, but like put on an album that you've never heard before or, um, or an old favorite, right? Just the lowest, the lowest barrier art form that you can engage with in your current state. Um, because that is, all, all art is in conversation with each other. Oh yeah, especially I think that's, that's one reason why I'm really glad that people are starting to recognize video games as art, because I mean, how could it not be? It hits every single note, right? Like there's music, there's storytelling, there's beautiful visuals, as well as like gameplay and games are art too, as far as I'm concerned. Like, um, so yeah, like, especially when you're depressed and like, can't really do anything. One thing that I do is like, I play video games, you know? And I, I think especially trying to support like indie video game artists and like, you know, downloading smaller, smaller, more thinky think games like off of Steam or off of personal websites. Like, it's just amazing how much is out there and how similar it is to other genres or mediums of art, you know, like comics and video games are very similar, I feel. And even to, you know, other things like theater or film or TV, like there's just so much cross pollination that I think is just fantastic. I'm going to out myself a little bit as um, just a, a small nerd, um, but I think of video games very much as the, the hollow novel on, on Star Trek. So <laughs> nice. Like, like, do I have to explain what I'm talking about? Um, because that's what they're doing. It's a video game, except that your body is in it, right? You're mm -hmm. following this narrative. You're going along with, um, with the game. And shout out to another um, Seattle intellectual Christopher A. Paul. Um, I, he, he writes books about comic, I'm mean, sorry, not about comics, about video games. Um, and I have a special nerdism in myself, which is that I will get really excited to read about things I know nothing about. And I've, I've played, I played Mario, Super Mario Brothers um, for the first time in 2013. So 
not a gamer. Uh, <laughs> as a kid, I played Frogger on my computer. It was a CD-ROM. Classic. Those don't exist anymore. <laughs> um, so I'm not I'm not a gamer, but I was so intrigued by the title of this book and looked into it, which is The Toxic Meritocracy of Video Games. Um, and he's written several books now, and they're all like very interesting, in-depth looks at, you know, the, I mean, gamer culture, sure, um, but also like the artistry behind video games and the the minds behind video games and like, you know, how capitalism ruins everything. Uh, <laughs> but I, I love that I never really made that connection on my own between comics and video games. Um, though, of course, I, I will never say that it's not art. Um, I just never would have made that connection. Mm. Actually, it's funny. Um, so I've been talking about my collaborator, Andrew. We built this website together. He, he got his first degree in um, engineering. So he's done a lot of programming, hence why he could help me with this developing this website. You know, he's been getting into like Unity and learning how to make video games. And I swear to God, like just seeing this trajectory, I'm like, we're probably gonna make a video game together. Like it seems almost inevitable at this point, just with our collaborative process. I'm like, oh, that's a natural progression. I could definitely see that happening. Like I'd make visuals and then he'd do, you know, some of the coding and like a soundtrack, and then I'd help him work out a narrative or something. So I'm like. I could definitely see that coming in the future. And it's going to be extremely difficult because every new project I seem to take on just like absurdly stupid, like large, difficult new tasks, like a new mountain to climb every time I do a project because I constantly want to like do more, like try harder. And then I just end up totally in the weeds, but it ends up being really fine. Like I have a website now that I built, you know, and that's very cool, but it was incredibly difficult to do. So yeah, okay, so good times. That's beautiful. So this is a great question. I've never been able to ask anyone this. So I'm very excited. And I mean like anyone in life, not like on Write More Light. Um, when you get excited about a new project and you um, are you know, out of your depth as far as like the skill scaffolding necessary for the project, um, how do you do that? I feel like anytime I start something I'm not immediately good at, I just abandon it and then get mm. really bitter. Um, yeah, no, I, I have a couple of friends with that problem also, but I think, and this is just like, I'm a complete edgelord. Like I will just be open about that. <laughs> I just, I love difficulty for some reason. Like if it's hard, I'm going to want to master it, you know, which is why like, you know, I started my, like when I was in college, I started my degree doing world literature which is basically like an offshoot of English. Um, and then I transferred to philosophy because I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do reading, but harder, you know? So I feel like when I start a new project, it's really more about like, I have the vision, you know, I have my eyes on the prize and I'll do whatever it takes in order to achieve that vision. And most of the time I don't know what it takes. And then once I'm in it, I'm like, oh, why did I do this? This is stupid, you know? Like, why did I have to choose the hardest way to do this thing? But, you know, you just beat your head against the wall until it's over, basically. Um, and, but yeah, the hard part, the hard part is like retaining motivation. But I think the most important thing is just like, keep your eye on the prize. You know, like if you know that the, that the end result that you're looking for is really important to you, then you'll like, you just, you need to focus on that in order to maintain motivation, which is why like, I wouldn't take on a project that I don't believe in, right? Like I had one project I was working on with some friends of mine, we were going to make this animated music video and I just got in way over my head. I spent like a year on it. I also, you know, got paid very little for the amount of hours that I did on it. Um, but it was one of those things where I was like, you know what, like I can't work on this anymore because it's not something that I believe in, you know, like the project wasn't important enough for me to want to bridge that gap of mastery. And so I had to quit the project basically. Um, and I still think to this day, it hasn't been released. So sorry, but, um, but yeah, I think, yeah, especially like with the website 40 time dot space, like I went into it being like, I don't know how to build a website. I'm just going to figure it out. But the reason why I ended up getting through it is because I really, really, really believed in the project and I needed, like, it felt like a, like a moral imperative to bring that work into the world, which is how I managed to finish basically. <laughs> That wouldn't otherwise. It's so hard. 
I, I mean, I know you're being a little self-effacing, but I think that's really beautiful that um, to believe so strongly in your art, or at least in art's place in the world is really beautiful. Um, and you made me think of something, which is that I've accomplished a lot of things just out of sheer ignorance of the difficulty. <laughs> Yep. And you know, I encourage congratulations, you. you know, like that's good, I think. I um I told you before we went live about uh Lauren Haldeman, who's a, a comic poet. Um, and I, I took a class with her once and I had been for years trying to figure out how to animate my short stories or or essays or whatever, because I thought that's the perfect form for um you know making the short story more accessible, right? We live in a very visual uh, quickly moving world and you know sitting down with a story is a commitment even if it's you know four pages it's a bit of a commitment and I took this class with her and she just had us like work in teams and use our phones to make little videos and you know one person would be drawing and then the next person would you know move the phone and put different things on the screen and I was like oh I could do that I could definitely yeah. do that way harder um, when you're not in that setting where everything is like <laughs> ready to go and you've got a team, yeah. but like, just out of sheer ignorance, I made a video, <laughs> sheer ignorance of the difficulty, not, I don't just make ignorant videos, I hope. <laughs> um, and yeah, I said, cool you, you took the class and you got inspired and you're like, I can do this. And you just did it, you know, like, that's really cool. I felt <laughs> both really stupid and like a genius when I was like, wait, is it really that easy? <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. Um, uh, shoot, I had a, an offshoot question that I was going to squirrel into there, and I lost it. Um, but I've got more questions. It's fine. I can do this. Um, so I know a handful of comic artists who comic writers who are not visual artists and they separate the two pieces of the comic as um, script and art, which um, I know there's plenty of famous <clears throat> comics out there where you, you know, you see the two off the two creators on the, on the cover. Um, why do you think that is? Why do you think um, folks don't more often try to bridge that gap or um, don't feel secure enough in doing both? Um, I, I'm very excited that there are people who, who do both, right? I, I went to school with somebody who was just a script writer and he was like, I tried to draw, but I can't draw. So I just look for artists and he spends all his time and a lot of money just looking for an artist to collaborate with. And that seems really sad to me. Um, mm -hmm. and it's also, you know, kind of what I was going through looking for someone to animate for me. So, um, I think that's a, collaboration happens. yeah, that's a good question. I think at least in America and in Japan, it's definitely an historical remnant of how the art form was initially distributed. So like for instance, here in the United States, that would be, you know, in the printing press or in the newspaper. So like, if you think about like the first comics that came out, like detective comics or action comics, which is basically like Batman and Superman, mm -hmm. Um, you would have a team of people doing all of the different steps to get it to print. So you would have like one guy doing the inks, you'd have one guy doing the penciling, you'd have one guy doing the colors, just so that it was like a streamlined, like basically like factory model to get it to print as fast as humanly possible. So I think that even today, DC Comics still has that same format where you have someone doing the, the pencils, the inks, the storyboards, the writing, blah, blah, blah. Um, mostly because making comics is an extremely time intensive, laborious process. And I don't want to say that to turn anyone off from making comics, but as someone, you know, I self publish my comics, which means I do everything myself, the printing, the binding, you know, the drawing, the writing, promotion, blah, 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 because I'm an idiot. I don't know. I love it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's one of those things where like, you don't do it unless you love it because it really does take a lot of effort to do everything, basically. So like with more mainstream comics, they parcel it out because it's, it's cheaper and it's more efficient. Yeah. So like if you have a comic where you have to release you know, one issue every week, you can hit that deadline if you have 10 people working on it. 
Whereas if I had if I had to make 13 pages of comics every week, I would die of exhaustion and overwork. So I think that's a part of the reason. But we are seeing a lot more um, artists, creators, especially in the independent comic scene, just because you know you don't have the money if you're printing and making your own comics to farm out those different steps. So in the indie comic scene, which is where my work is, there's a lot more artist creators that just do everything by themselves. So. That's really interesting. I never ever thought of it like, um, I interrupted you to say like an assembly line. Um, yeah. And I think part of, so here's like my, my personal pet peeve and one of the reasons I so wanted to have you on the show um, is that a lot of the times comics aren't real literature. Um, I mean, no, it's perceived that way. <laughs> that is not sometimes true. Um, and and part of my like trying to parcel that out in my brain is obviously some people are like, oh, well, we have picture books or we have books. And that's not, comic books are neither of those things. Mm -hmm. um, picture books, of course, being books for children um, who are, you know, under the age of eight and need, need or want pictures to go along with the narrative. Um, and because, you know, I've um, worked with children and I've worked in bookstores and I've worked in literature um, and, and I do that a lot, um, that the, the adult in the room says that that's not proper literature. Um, I'm the adult in the room now. <laughs> uh, and, and I always wonder, you know, like if you take the comics away and you just have the script there, um, you know, is that somehow better? Like you're getting less art and you're getting less story just by virtue of taking some of the story away. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I just can't figure it out. Um, yeah, I can address that. Um, I think the, the one thing that people say that I think is kind of like the cop out, but it does kind of work in this favor. Like, well, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you have words and pictures, you're going to be saying even more is a way of thinking about it. I think, yeah, the weird thing about like our comics literature, I'm like, well, no, because they're comics, you know, like it's its own thing, sort of like video games, like we're video games literature. I'm like, no, because literature is literature, you know? And I think because people have this sort of like binary thinking where it's like pictures and words are like two completely different categories that it just keep, it prevents people from realizing the potential of hybridity that you see in mediums like comics, which I think is like the greatest strength of the medium personally, because you can do so much when the words and images are integrated, interact with each other in different ways. And you create a different sort of experience, a different reading experience when you have access to that, um, that sort of meaning making. But I think the other funny thing too, is that now that comics are being sort of like or at least like in the publishing world, they're being like pitched as literature by calling them graphic novels. And I'm like, that's stupid. Um, anyways, that's just my personal beef with the term graphic novel, because I'm like, it's not a graphic novel, it's a comic. Like, don't try and make it sound like it's a novel. It doesn't need to be a novel. It's a comic. It already is its own thing. But so we see like the canonization of serious comics, like uh, Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis or Art Spiegelman's Mouse or literally anything by Chris Ware because people just want to kiss his feet and I don't understand why. Um, but then you also have this thing where in publishing, like I went to a bookstore the other day and the comic section, the whole top row, there was just one bookshelf. The whole top row was all book adaptations. They even had two adaptations by different artists of the great Gatsby. And I was like, why, <laughs> like, why? It's already a book, you know, like just read the book. Also a movie. <laughs> yeah, there's there's so many ways to interact with The Great Gatsby. Like, un admittedly, the art was amazing. And I was like, oh, I kind of want to read that because it looks really good. But it's just interesting to me that people are like, oh, well, maybe people will consider comics to be literature if we make literature into comics. That's funny. Right? I'm like, opposite. that's just stupid, you know? Um, here's a, and I really, really love this book. So I'm like sad to crap on this author. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw on Twitter that S.E. Hinton flat out refused to um, to allow a comic adaptation of The Outsiders. And her reasoning oh. was really crappy. Her reasoning was, oh. 
people are always so proud that this is the first real book they ever wrote that that word real there uh or read the first real book they ever read and i am not going to make it into something that's less literary or something but it was the real book um yeah and- that is the worst reasoning <laughs> it's like i would I, I totally understand like if i wrote a novel and it'd be like that's like people saying i want a movie adaptation i'm like that is totally legit like i don't want a comic adaptation of your book either frankly because i just would rather read your book right but <laughs> but I see it as so much more accessible and yeah. I'm here for anything that gets story in people's hands and maybe that's the problem right we use the word literature with a capital L to mean like worthy of clout and and adoration and what I'm really looking for what I'm really saying when I talk about literature is story or narrative um and I think it's actually totally problematic that we separate these things out. I remember um, going to a Walden Books as a kid and they um, they had lots of different sections and none said fiction, right? They had a literature section and then, you know, everything else. Um, and being how small Walden Books were, I don't, you, you know, you're not four. Um, by the way, anyone under 25 is four. That's not an insult to anyone. That's just how it is in my head. Um, anyway, um, and it was like only classics, right, in this literature section. And I think that that is pretty common, that like, if the book isn't over 50 years old, it's not literature. Yeah. Thing. That's some hooey right there. It is but garbage. I guess, yeah, I, I also want to read I sort of want to reapproach the issue of classics in comics form also, because I also don't want to take a dump on, you know, these potentially really good comics that are out there, especially since one of my favorite comics is um, Peter Cooper's adaptation of uh, Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. It's oh, an amazing that. comic. It's like Peter well, Cooper's style for that book is like woodblock print. Like it looks like etchings and it's just incredible. And like, I love, I love Kafka's Metamorphosis. I've read it like 30 times, like in school and stuff like that. But that one comic actually made me appreciate the book even more. So I think there is a place for comic adaptations. I just think it's getting a little out of hand. But on the other hand, like you said, you know, there's a comic adaptation of the Odyssey that's pretty good. And if that gets people to be interested in reading the Odyssey, which is historically speaking, a very hard book, especially for younger people to read, then it's like, by all means, you know, like read the comic book version of the Odyssey. If it gets you to read the other Odyssey, then that's great. Otherwise, you still get a good story about it. Right. I think that the problem with the Odyssey is that it's so old that like every time we try to retranslate it or whatever, um, we see it as like dumbing it down when the the fact is that this is a really old story and it wasn't high brand <laughs> at the time. Um, yes. What we're I mean, doing is literally a folk story. song that you'd sing around the campfire when right. a traveling bard would come to your village, you know, like that's not high art. <laughs> I, get, I, get, I get really snippy about this topic in particular when we're talking about like Beowulf and I'm like, but it's not high art. It's just old. Yes. Do you oh, know I'm how many art jokes yeah. are in Shakespeare? Yeah, Gilgamesh is still one of my favorites just like ever. And if I were to adapt an old thing, I'm like, I would totally do Gilgamesh. See, and I also like now I hate <laughs> myself for being like that's not high art because it's still art. It's still an excellent story. It's just that we like put it up on this pedestal by virtue of its age, and that's not cute. Like that's not. Yeah. We can just love art because it exists and is fun. And for some reason, or just like a miracle that like Gilgamesh has survived. You know the sands of time. You know, like that's impressive. It doesn't matter if it was like the best, greatest epic poem ever. It's like, well, it's just really, really old. And that's interesting enough. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a glimpse at like what was entertaining or what was culturally relevant or normal at the time. And mm. that's cool. Like that kind of documentation can stand alone. Yes. We don't but have you don't have to like the Canterbury Tales, for instance, you know. <laughs> Personal beef with the Canterbury Tales. <laughs> I, I can appreciate that. Oh, who did you say wrote or adapted oh. the Metamorphosis? Peter Cooper. That's K-U-P-E-R. Peter Cooper? Mm-hmm. He's a great, great comics artist. Yeah, I'm, His I'm, art is so weird and like, perfectly matches the style. Metamorphosis. Okay. Uh, spelling is hard. 
Oh, I love this. Hey, Therese. Um, we have got a comment saying, I love the description of real in the Velveteen Rabbit. And I feel like that's um, all we needed this whole time. <laughs> Seriously. She, I read that. I read that a couple months ago and I cried. I was like, I am still a child. <laughs> she diluted it to its perfect, uh, dis distil she distilled it down to words are hard. Um, <laughs> she got the essence right in one sentence. That was what I'm saying. Um, so I think it's really interesting that you take issue with the term graphic novel. It's not something <laughs> you thought of. Um, and all you did was like point out what the words are. <laughs> um, because for me, I was just, it just is, you know, like things just have names and you move on sometimes without interrogating them or, or why. And I just, I never thought of it. And you're great. It's totally just branding. We're calling it the graphic novel. It is a visual novel. And like, that is trying to to like scale it up in the fancy pants zone. Um, <laughs> I'm eloquent. Um, and that's so interesting. That's so interesting. I have a lot of beef with the way we market literature because it's all about sales. Um, and and I think it's a huge, huge issue that we need to like be more highbrow in order to get credit for creating. Like that's nonsense. I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, because I never, I use the terms interchangeably and I totally, I just, you've blown my mind and I'm just gonna keep telling you, you blew my mind until I move on. <laughs> um, I also think it'd just be really funny. Like if you make comics, but you self-identify as like a graphic novelist. I'm like, it just sounds really poncy once you like say it out loud. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I'm a graphic novelist. Are you telling me you write pictures? Like what? Um, so I'm going to get to some, some softer questions because um, my brain isn't going to be able to expand that much more today. <laughs> um, for folks who are new to reading the graphic novel, um, what are some titles you would recommend? Right. Um... I was thinking, you know, I think the most important thing is to recognize that comics is a vast medium. Right, so, we have all the genres in there. Yeah, so realistically, it's like, oh, you know, do you like sci-fi? You could find comics that are sci-fi. Do you like fantasy? You could find some fantasy comics. So like any genre that you already like, you can find a comic that's going to give you what you want in that genre. I'm so frustrating to people is what's happening. <laughs> But yeah, I'll, so like, I'll be, I'll be like, like, what do you like? And people are like, I'm asking so I can recommend to you. You ask me. <laughs> Keep but sorry. yeah, no, I mean, like, like if you like crime noir, Black Sad is a great series. Um, I was thinking Black Sad. Yeah, it's by um, uh, this Spanish artist. And of course, I don't remember his name offhand, oh, but he used to draw for Disney, actually. And so his, yeah, his comics are amazing. I just started reading, like, if you like the the podcast, My Brother, My Brother and Me, or anything by the McElroys, they have a comic of their D&D &D podcast. Um, what was it called? I have it on my shelf. Oh, The Adventure Zone. There's, an, there's a, a graphic novelization of The Adventure Zone that's hilarious, and I love it. I think there's, like, three volumes out. Um, what else? Um... I'd say also just like go to your, your local comic shop and just look around. And I, I encourage you to look for a more indie comic shop so you can find stuff that aren't just like, you know, superheroes and capes and stuff. Because I know that a lot of people have this misconception that like, oh, comics are just for, you know, like Superman types and like Marvel and stuff. And I'm like, actually, no, that's like a very small minority of what comics has to offer. That's just what we see marketed for us in the United States. Um, but yeah, I'd say what's, well, oh man, there's just so much stuff out there and it's all really fantastic. Um, so yeah, just look around, maybe pick up some zines. Cause I know that, you know, supporting local indie artists is always really good and you never know what you might find. There's some really weird, really hilarious stuff out there. So yeah, just have an open mind and an like, open wallet because comics can be expensive. Do you, do you, you, have you been to Quimby's? Yeah, yeah, I sell my work at Quimby's actually. My favorite place ever. 
Yes. <laughs> um, so you mentioned earlier um, Persepolis and Mouse. Are there um, what are what are some like popular? I guess those are both nonfiction. Um, but what yes. are some, like, popular titles that you particularly like? I mean, anything by Marjane Satrapi is amazing. I actually, Chicken with Plums, her other book is fantastic. And I actually prefer it to um, Persepolis in multiple ways. Um, but that one's got more like magical realism, but it's still like, it feels semi-autobiographical also. So that one's a good one. Um, God, now I'm trying to think, of course, I'm having like complete- I know, I, no, you know what? <laughs> I warned you about this question. Um, yeah, right? <laughs> I was about to feel really bad for putting you on the spot, but I reject that notion. No, um, I was going to say, there's also just like, oh, I love manga so much and there's so much good manga out there. I actually, if I'm going to recommend anything, um, Hayao Miyazaki, the founder of Studio mm -hmm. Ghibli, made a, an epic comic called Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which is what the film was based off of. And that comic is probably one of my most favorite comics of all time. And I just read it like a month ago. So that one's I fantastic. Just read my first manga last month. Um, I think I said this before we were recording, but I go through phases where like, and this is like for years at a time, I can't read a comic because I can't, like, I just won't look at the pictures. And that's not how that works. That's <laughs> at least half the story, if not more. Um, but I just read my first manga last month. It was a Junji Ito. Nice. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to admit it was his cat diary. So it was Oh yeah, that was great. Um, that was super cute. I laughed and cried. Um, so it wasn't like his horror, but I, um, I really appreciate my, my spouse is super into horror yeah. in general and read um, Uzumaki a few years ago. Yes. Just been slowly uh, accumulating the collection. Um, so actually I'm going to put that down. Look at me. I was going to say, I highly recommend Uzumaki Enter the Spiral. I read it all in one sitting. I stayed up until 4 a.m. and I couldn't sleep. So you've been warned. It's very oh, scary. Yeah, that's actually why I haven't read it. Um, <laughs> by Spirals. Um, they're supposed to be making an animated series out of it soon too. And I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> I had free, wait, no, one thing at a time. Um, I think the first comic I read properly was Black Hole. Um, Lewis oh. gave it to me. And that is a well, very Lewis recommendation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually gotten a lot of a lot of recommendations from Lewis on on comics. And I own like six books that I I found a book, a book. I found a box that was unpacked um, since my move. Uh, for, since my move from Seattle four five years ago. Um, oh that's so sad. I always say I just got to Iowa, but I'm lying. <laughs> um, and it had a book called Vapor in it. It had, uh, which I haven't read, but it's like, I think black and white and one color. And it's like a other world situation. Um, oh, look at that. You're taking the recommendation. Um, I know American born Chinese. So oh yeah, that one's a good one. What, like, that one's autobiographical also. I was thinking if you liked Black Hole, which is by Charles Burns, which is a very weird comic, I recommend Daniel Klaus of Velvet Glove Cast. I love Daniel Klaus. I totally lied to you. The first comic I ever read was Ghost World. Oh yeah, classic. That's so funny. So many people say that. They're like, that's how I got into comics. It's a great comic. Very questionable with the old man who's hitting on a young girl, very awkward to read in retrospect, but no, it's a great comic. I reread. I watched the movie recently. So I saw the movie first and mm -hmm. decided I needed to, I mean, I always wanted to be Thora Birch, um, but decided to model <laughs> my whole personality after Enid, which probably had some bad side effects. Um, <laughs> then I read the book and was obsessed with it, read it so many times, but I rewatched that movie recently and I was like, this is the most depressing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Yeah, it's very. It's a very questionable movie. I have not reread the book, and I will say for anyone who hasn't experienced both, um, the comic is a bunch of different like days in the life of these characters, and the movie is like one possible scenario with the characters. Um, but I, I think like I saw an alternate ending originally or something because I did not remember it ending on such a sad note. Uh, <laughs> 
anyway, I love Daniel Klaus. Uh, which book did you recommend by him? Oh, A Velvet Glove Cast in Iron. It's like a very dark, horror-ish, like mystery. And it's kind of short, but it's very powerful. Um, and I also remembered another one thinking of um, Ghost World. I was thinking of Harvey Pekar, American Splendor, which oh, was yeah. also a movie. Um, <laughs> but the comics are just incredible. Um, but also like, yeah, I guess I should have a caveat in there. There's a lot of underground comics from like the sixties and seventies that are written by totally like machismo misogynist men who are complete pigs. So there's a lot of people that like in the comics canon, those comics are like put up on a big pedestal, like Zach, com Zach because, comics. And because of their age. <sighs> And because at the time they were like super like revolutionary and experimental. And it was like, you know, the first time that self-published indie comics actually were in the spotlight. But so I recommend like R. Crumb, I guess, like if you're into that style. Um, but R. Crumb's Harvey Pekar comics are really good. Um, but the guy himself is a complete pig. So you've been warned, you know, <laughs> like if you see questionable imagery in there, like that was just what they were doing at the time. So um, I'm just noticing the time. I was going to keep going uh, as long as you're available. Do you, do you need to get going? It's two now. Um, I actually do have a therapy appointment, so I guess we should wrap it up, but yeah, it has been really fun joining though, so. Um, I might beg to have you back to talk about the actual questions that I wrote in advance. Um, <laughs> wow, I am having the best time. Thank you so, so much. Um, for folks who are taken off now, because you know that that's the end point, um, please go write more light into your life. Um, I will set the five minute timer for the prompt, but we will let whew, my, my phone has a lot of notifications on it, um, but we will let Elk go. Um, I know that you prepared a prompt for us, so please, please advise. Yes. Um, so I was thinking in theme with the, you know, text and image discussion that we were having for the writing prompt, try and think of a very strong visual memory that you have, potentially from your childhood or the recent past, like maybe of, you know, like a birthday party or a vacation or maybe just a singular memory, like from school, um, and try and describe that moment in vivid detail as if you were right there experiencing it. Um, I think birthday party was a cool, I'm just going to um, throw out a couple of uh, prompts for how to find your memory. Um, I like to, to poke people with their 10th birthday because I feel like you look forward to it a lot being that double digit. Um, maybe there's like your second grade classroom or um, I know a lot of people that like, can't remember past age 10. Um, <laughs> so maybe that's a bad idea um, or like a, a repeat vacation spot or favorite park or donut shop. Um, I'm going to set that timer. Thank you so, so, so much for hanging out with me, Alec. Um, you are a star. Um, and I hope you too write more light into your life. Thanks. I will. <laughs> I'm going to start the timer. You can dip if you need to. And um, otherwise I'll be doing the free write with my, my dear friends who are hanging out. Me some time to find my nope. As always, it's totally fine if you end up journaling.
one minute left. I'm gonna see if I can turn the volume down on that. It's ridiculous every time I jump out of my skin. Um, <laughs> thank you so much everybody for hanging out today. I am so uh, astounded and awed and, and honored to have been able to spend that time with Elk today. I never met him before. We have some mutual friends and um, I'm so, so grateful for the insight and uh, knowledge that that he provided um i really do hope that we'll have him on again so please let me know what questions you may have for him um at the very least i'll uh, poke him until i get answers and I'll just post those <laughs> um as always please write more light into your life <laughs>